Devon's coast, with its bountiful free harvest of fish, has long provided an income for those prepared to brave the elements. But even before people fished in boats, they were delving into the sand looking for shellfish. It's a tradition that continued well into the Edwardian era. Ruth has travelled to the Dorset coast to meet John Wright in search of a popular Edwardian harvest, the brown shrimp. And what we're doing is squeeze the sand and they get scared and they jump out and they jump straight into the net. If you get a really big one, it will jump over the net. Really? Yeah, so of course you can, ca you can catch it the second time around. <laughs> John makes his living teaching the art of foraging on land and sea. Now, I've seen all these images of women working on the beaches, gathering and so forth, and they sort of fall into two camps. There's young girls who haul all their skirts up round, and, you know, people like to take photographs of them because it was almost pornographic, you know, ankles. I can, I can <laughs> see what they mean, you know, it's, um, it's oh. working. But then there's other images, particularly of older women, of um, mature women, um, and they just go into the sea with the skirts straight down for the modesty. And this really is the sort of job that people who hadn't got any other form of income were doing, isn't it? You know, if you were a big tough bloke, you would be out at sea fishing because you could make far more money if you lived on the coast by being out than you could tripping up and down. No, nothing yet. Oh, We've got a crab. I have got shrimp. We've got some. Oh, oh, well, have, got, look. Well, you're better than me. Wow, look wow, at that. That was your first scoop. Go. We've got about ten in one scoop. That's amazing, that is. I think you might, might better make your fortune with <laughs> this. You can see it's a brown shrimp, because there's little speckles on the back. Yeah. That's uh, camouflage, so it's not seen in the sand. Mm -hmm. Shellfish were so abundant and easy to catch that they made little money at market, very much a poor man's food. But Ruth has thought of a way to increase their value. In them actually because we've got wild garlic coming up all over the valley so I could do wild garlic and potted shrimps and if I do them in nice little ramekins then I can sell them you know you don't need very many to have a saleable product after a morning of foraging Ruth has a bucket full of shrimp I might add to her having seen just how hard it is to collect them these little potted shrimps there's not going to be many shrimps per pot <laughs> No, there's a lot of wrapping, very few shrimps. <laughs> yeah, it would have to do, wouldn't it? Oh. Peter and Alex have successfully brought their beef herd through the harshest winter in 30 years by feeding them hay. Now spring's arrived. Traditionally, this is when cattle go out to pasture to feed on grass. But deep in the valley, grass is thin on the ground. We're running so desperately low on pasture that we've taken up the offer of some meadow much further up the river valley. So we're going to drive all of our cattle along a really quite risky drove road along the valley to this new pasture. But we do want to separate out some of our cows. Alex is leaving behind one of the pregnant cows whose due date is fast approaching. It's her, isn't it? That one there. Yeah. Along with a prize calf they hope to sell. You as well. Morning. 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 How are you? Very well. Local farmer Sarah Burt owns the pasture three miles up the valley where the cows are headed. She's come to help them move the herd, a process known as droving. I think they'll be glad of the new grass. I think they certainly will. Some fresh grass. Yeah, Mum. In Edwardian Britain, Beef was an excellent moneymaker. To the Edwardian farm worker, these cows would have been worth almost six years' wages. So it's vital they get them to their new pasture safely. Let's get them all comfortable with the lane. Get your fresh pasture here. This is the matriarch, and where she goes, the rest follow. In the age before railways, and the motor car, the only way to get your cattle from your farm to market was to drove. And back in medieval times, it wasn't unheard of for cattlemen to drive their cows all the way from places like uh, the highlands and islands of Scotland to London. And even by the Edwardian period, this was something that was still practiced. But of course, with the motor car, it became increasingly more dangerous to try and drive your cattle. 
Special drove roads, some 90 feet wide, developed over the centuries. Of course, when the railways came along, it made it much easier to transport cattle long distances, and better still, if they were stuck in a, a cabin on a, on a train, they wouldn't lose weight. They wouldn't be exercising heavily, and if you did drive your cattle long distances, obviously you could damage their hooves, and they would lose a lot of what actually makes them of value. Come on, on you go. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. The matriarch leads. She's desperate to get in front of me, though, because she's the boss. She thinks she should be in front of me. There it goes. Up to 400 cattle were moved at a time. But the boys are having trouble keeping their small herd on the right path. Get them. Get them. Oh, no, don't go down there. Come on, I think. Get them. Get them. Get them. Get them, Get them. Get them. If they don't get the situation under control quickly, they could lose the entire herd. I think the cows have gone all the way down to the, uh, to the river. It's extraordinary stuff, isn't it? At the shoreline, John is helping Ruth find another long-lost delicacy, lava. Well, there's several types. Um, this is the most common type, and it's an extraordinary material. It's a very thin membrane, quite tough, um, and incredibly chewy, and it doesn't look at all edible. Lava is a type of seaweed that's boiled to make a dish called lava bread. There's lots of it about, isn't there? There's no shortage. No, because nobody picks it, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> but in the Edwardian era, the poor would have picked lava to give their families a cheap, nutritious meal. It's protein rich. You could pretty well almost live off the stuff. Yeah. It's very good for you. I think I'll take a load back, actually, and see if the boys like it. I don't know if they've ever had lava bread. Oh, cows. Where are you going? Come on! Alex and Peter are still trying to round up the herd, but weighing in at almost half a ton each, it's no mean feat. He's having to just run down a near vertical slope just to try and get in front of them, because they were building up a head of steam. Finally, the drove's back on track. When Sarah gave us the offer of some pasture further up the valley, we almost bit her hand off. It's got so dry that despite the warmth, the grass is just not pushing through. That succulent spring grass, which these cows and we've been waiting for throughout the winter. At last, they've reached their destination. And they're all just making their way up into this top field. So they've got plenty of pasture here now. This should see them good for two or three weeks. Peter's just shouting up at me, good to be alive, good to be alive. On mornings like this, you really feel it though. That was just great. That should be, yes. At the cottage, Ruth's processing the haul of shrimp. Another batch ready. The shrimp have been boiling for four minutes. They change colour when you cook them. They start to look a bit more pink. <laughs> Little pots of cooked, ready-to-eat shrimps were sold in the best food shops and they were served in the best restaurants. You're never going to make your fortune with shellfish. But on the other hand, it's surprisingly reliable as a catch. The next stage is to add some melted butter to seal the shrimp. Mrs. Beaton, she suggests cayenne pepper and whole mace in your butter for potted shrimp. But I thought, seeing as every dish and a little tiny bit of spare ground round here is covered in wild garlic, I'd throw a bit in. Not too much, because the Edwardians were notorious for not liking too much garlic. Potting is one of the simplest ways of preserving. By pouring the fat on, it fills in all the little gaps and means there's no air in there. Bacteria need oxygen to grow. If there's no air, even the few bacteria that might be around can't get going. 
It's not exactly going to make me my millions, but this is quite a nice steady little additional income. Back in September, Alex and Peter built a hayrick to feed the cattle through the winter months. Finding out whether the hay is edible. Now the cows are feeding on grass, they've got a surplus of hay. Edwardians would have sold this, so Alex has asked Devon farmer Francis Mudge to assess its quality. It's, it's smelling nice, yeah, it ain't that all right. It smells, you know, fairly sweet, uh, uh, the, the bullocks and that'll eat that, no trouble at all. So you're looking for sweetness? Yeah, yeah, look at, you know, looking at... So we've actually had a chance to bale some of the stuff out of the rick. Yeah. This, this is from the top, isn't it? Like, you know, you can see it's not... not That's quite, right. Not quite so good as that in the, in the, in the bottom there, right? You know? Right. And also, I would have thought it's a different part of the field, isn't it? Uh, it is, actually. It's, it's one of the higher meadows. Yeah, yeah, because it, it's a lot coarser grass than... In yeah, the, the bottom of that, right? I mean, is this still sellable as a, as a feed stuff? Oh, well, yeah, cattle will still eat it. They'll still eat it? Yeah. They'll still yeah. go for that. With expanding Edwardian cities came more horses, needing even more food. So there was a tidy profit to be made from selling hay. What we are concerned about, first and foremost, is whether this is a good enough quality to sell at market. Yeah, you, 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 could, you could sell it. it could, animals would eat it. There's nothing wrong with that. It's only a, it's a bit coarser than the other, but they'll still eat it all. It's, it's eatable. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. With the excess hay taken care of, the boys are turning their minds to the pregnant cow they held back from the drove. They've never delivered a calf before, so have come to get some advice from an old friend. Ah. Hello, Sue. Hello, Good how are you? Good to see you again. Hi, Sue. Sue Farquhar's been breeding Red Ruby cattle for over 15 years and has a new addition to her herd. And how old's this one? Oh, that arrived yesterday morning. Right. Was it quite an easy birth, this one? <laughs> well, uh, I came down in the morning to find him here. Our calving is imminent. We've actually got, within the next couple of weeks, haven't we, we've got our calves to due. Yes. So should we anticipate any problems when we're calving? On the whole, no. If it was a maiden heifer, one calving for the first time, or well, you've got to give her masses of time. But these, well, when they're older, you can come round the corner and nothing's happening, and half an hour later you've got a calf on the ground. <laughs> Just before she's due to calve, mm. she'll get very loose at the back. Here, either side of the tail head, she'll get a lot looser. You can see it's quite loose. She hasn't fully tightened back up again after calving. Right. But it will get looser and looser. How much time have we then got before calving? Two days, two, three days. And I suppose while ours are giving birth, we're not going to have to intervene that much. I would hope you'll come down in the morning and you will find a calf. Right. It's mid-April. The farm is in full bloom and Ruth's shrimp enterprise is well underway. The cattle are feasting on their new pasture and back on the farm the team are carefully monitoring their expectant cow. But there's one problem that's been nagging Alex. Crossing the River Tamar from here by road is a 12-mile round trip. It's something of a boundary, actually, between ourselves here and all of the villagers that share the same landscape on the other side of the river. So Alex wants to build a coracle, an ancient portable boat designed to be used by one person. He's enlisted woodcraft expert Sean Hellman to help him make one. Hi, Sean. Hello. Sean's been making coracles for 20 years, using techniques handed down over the centuries. So how do we get started? Right. Uh, we cut a load of willow right, okay. this morning. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, really fresh, really, really bendy. Yeah, yeah, I can see. 
such a fast growing woods. And I suppose in the Edwardian period, they would have known so much more about their woods than we do today. Almost oh, certainly, yes, yes. A, a lot of very common knowledge. Different woods are suited to different things. Willow, great for baskets, nice and flexible. Yep. Excellent for the coracle here. Right. 